Well, it is good to be here with you tonight, and uh, it's good to be in the Lord's house, uh, as always, and I hope that you look forward to the time together with God's family and under the preaching of His Word, and our family has enjoyed getting to know you. I must say it's been a little difficult uh, to remember names and uh, a lot of similar names in this church and just remembering where the faces go and the challenges of remembering where I met you. And, you know, sometimes in just a, sh a short amount of time when you meet somebody in a large crowd, you just remember the shirt they were wearing, the tie they had on, something distinctive. But, you know, when you get to know people over the course of time, most people don't wear the sh same shirt, the same tie, maybe some, uh, you know, all the time. So it changes. And so uh, I appreciate your patience with us as we try to get to know each of you. And uh, so uh, I just thank the Lord that he brought us here. And we're going to be in Psalm 78 tonight, Psalm 78. And I want to just kind of give you a bit of information about our family uh, so you can kind of get to know us a little bit. And I'm thankful, um, as Pastor Sullivan already said, uh, that this is something that, that I believe that God has put together. And I appreciate the song that the ladies just sang, Trust and Obey. Uh, that word trust was something that God has used the last several months within my life and the, the lives of our family. And just to continue to keep our eyes upon the Lord and remembering that uh, it's Him that's guiding our lives. And I'm so thankful for that. A um, little bit about myself personally. I grew up in a Christian home, and I praise the Lord for the Christian heritage. I trust if you're here tonight and you have a, a godly heritage that you rejoice in that. Young people don't ever think it's a bad thing to grow up in a Christian home. Amen. Or you have parents that care for you, uh, parents that invest into your lives. Yes, there may, may be some rules that you disagree with at times, but those are some things that God helps us uh, see the character develop in us. And I'm so thankful, you know, as a teenager, I didn't appreciate everything that my parents told me that I had to do, but I'm thankful that they made me do it and taught me the whys, why I needed to do it. And I'll tell you, listening to these teenagers up here singing tonight has just been a, a great blessing. In the last couple of Sundays that we've been here has been quite an encouragement. Uh, the last 16 years, the Lord has allowed me to be a youth pastor. Uh, not all in the same place. The last 13 years, we've been serving out in British Columbia. I was in a couple of other places uh, in Ontario and in the Buffalo, New York area. Uh, but the opportunity to invest in young people is, is quite a, a blessing. And it's quite rewarding. And I want to tell you, as parents, those of you that are investing into your, your young people, keep at it. Keep up the good work. You know, the hearts of these teenagers really at times are in the balance. And the devil is fighting, and we know that God is on their side, or they are on God's side. And um, just continue to encourage them. A great church family here. Uh, I grew up in that Christian home, and I made a profession of faith when I was five years old. And I still remember the time meeting with my parents after the uh, Sunday evening service, uh, lying in my bedroom, coming out and talking to them. But you know, it wasn't until I was actually in my first semester of Bible college, uh, the Lord allowed me to go to Northland Baptist Bible College in uh, Dunbar, Wisconsin, uh, which is no longer, sadly, no longer in existence as far as I know. And I went there for my, my first semester. I wanted to play ice hockey, and they had a hockey team, and I know that's a great reason to go to Bible college. Uh, but, you know, uh, I hear you have ice here in the wintertime, so looking forward to that. I've been warned, you know, many times, you know, it gets cold there in the wintertime. You're moving from the West Coast. I, I've heard all about it. You know, you'll see how we, how we make it through. If we leave halfway through the winter, you'll know why. Uh, we like that Pacific warm air. Uh, but I went to, to Northland, and I spent all my savings that I had there first semester. And it was in that time that God brought evangelist Tom Farrell and he preached the opening meetings of the college. And it was there that he preached a message on Judas Iscariot. And in that message, he talked about Judas Iscariot being uh, what he said, the senior who committed suicide the night before his graduation. And I remember the message. I remember as he preached, he talked about Judas and how he had been with the Lord. Uh, he walked the walk. He talked the talk. If you remember the disciples, when Jesus said that, uh, that tonight one of you shall betray me, and the disciples began to question, is it I? They never pointed fingers at Judas and says it's him. There was something about Judas that only Jesus Christ knew. And it was something that wasn't genuine in his heart. He was not a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was in that time that I had doubts even before that uh, for several years, struggling with it. And 
Whether or not my salvation was genuine when I was five, I'm thankful that that night I settled it and got it dealt with that night. And so I rejoice in the day of my salvation and in all that the Lord has done in my life, in the life of my family. It was after that semester that I went to Faithway Baptist College here in Canada, and uh, the Lord really began to burden my heart for this nation of Canada. Uh, if you didn't already know, I am an American citizen. Please don't hold it against me. I know there's others in this room with that same status, uh, so please don't hold it against them either. And there's something about being close to the border here, a little bit of division between us right now, uh, but uh, I still thank the Lord that He's brought me here to this country. It was in 2003 that I started in Faithway there, and the Lord led me through college, and I got my degree, and most importantly, I met my wife. Uh, so I praise the Lord for that, my wife Rachel, and uh, we were married in 2007, and began serving the Lord together, and uh, the Lord has been so faithful to us, and it was in 2009, uh, my wife was expecting our oldest son, Joshua, was about three months away from the due date, uh, that uh, we moved out west to Vancouver area, British Columbia, and started working in Anchor Baptist Church uh, with Brother Ben Turner, and uh, I praise the Lord for the work that he has done there uh, in Burnaby, is actually the city next door to Vancouver, and really, I think the order of expensive places to live in Canada goes, Vancouver is number one, I think Toronto is number two, and then Burnaby is number three or number four, I can't remember exactly, but just a very expensive place to live. If you, if you need a house in Vancouver, it will cost you around $2 million, and so we could not afford a house there, uh, so we thank the Lord for how He provided for us while we were in that place, and served the Lord there for just over 13 years. And uh, we've come here really clearly by the direction of the Lord. And um, I don't know how much information I'm allowed to give or supposed to give, but I'll give it. If it was the wrong information to give, I'll apologize for it later, I guess. Uh, March 31st, uh, we were expecting to meet our new landlord at our house, the house that we were renting, a portion of the house in, um, uh, was, was sold. And the realtor had told us that the, the new owner would like to keep you uh, in the house, and so we were looking forward to meeting the new landlord. On March 31st, he came and he brought us a notice, and it was not an introduction of himself being our new landlord, it was a notice to move out of the house. And it was on that point that God really began to turn some things in a direction that we would not have known uh, over these last four months. And it was a Thursday, and uh, Pastor Sullivan called me the, the next Thursday on April 7th, I believe it was, and he asked me to consider coming here to Pemina Valley and Canadian Baptist Bible College and to pray about the position as the vice president. And honestly, I was very humbled when he called me. Uh, as he said, we haven't spoken a lot over the years. I've known him uh, being at Faithway. He came and preached. And many years ago, I was actually here in this church in 2006 on tour for Faithway. And uh, most of you may not remember me, uh, possibly, if you have a good memory. Uh, but it was, uh, it was there on April 7th that he called and said, would you consider praying about it? And at that time, honestly, I didn't really know what to think. And it wasn't something that I was looking for. I wasn't looking for a new position. I wasn't looking to, to move on. Um, the next Thursday, I got another, another phone call from another place and said, would you consider coming to be our pastor? And I thought, Lord, what are you doing? I can't be in three places at one time. And you know, sometimes when God begins to move you, He will begin to stir in your heart. He will begin to stir the comforts of life. And that's what it seemed that God was beginning to do. What we knew is comfortable. The ministry that we were serving in, the home that we were living in, uh, the place that we were in, we were happy to be there. We were comfor comfortable uh, to be there. But God was beginning to stir. And, and so we just kind of continued on. We prayed. And honestly, nobody else, uh, even within our family, knew about it. My wife and I just continued to pray and seek the Lord. We began to make phone calls regarding houses, and, and we just continued to see door after door get closed. And we began to wonder, is God in this? What is God doing? And I want to encourage you that the Bible says, they that seek the Lord will understand all things. The will of God is not being hidden to you and I. If we will seek the Lord, He will reveal it to us. We need to be faithfully seeking Him. 
And so we began to, to really pray, and I, I had already met with, with my pastor and began to, to talk to him. And of course, it's, it's a difficult thing to discuss and uh, talk about leaving the ministry that you've been in for, for 13 years. And, and I appreciate the, the love that he, he's shown to our family and just the, the willingness to, to allow us to come and visit. And when we were here a few weeks ago, God just confirmed in our hearts uh, that this is the place that we are to be. And so we're glad that we're here, and I hope that you're, you're glad that we're here. Maybe as you get to know us, you might not be so glad. Uh, but thank you for welcoming us into the church family this morning. And I know that many of you have, have made the effort to try and get to know our family, and um, we're very grateful for that. And so thank you for your love. Uh, for those of you that are, have already donated some things, thank you so much for your, your giving. And uh, may the Lord bless you abundantly for it. Um, Tonight I want to talk about something that kind of just ties into what our family has, has gone through, has seen over these last four months, and uh, talking about reaching the next generation. Tonight I've entitled my sermon, A Generation of Hope. A Generation of Hope. And I kind of call this last four months our unexpected faith journey. Um, the reality is the Christian life is a faith journey. And God calls us to be faithful on this journey of faith, and to continue to keep our eyes upon Him. Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Aren't you glad that as Jesus Christ hung on the cross, His proclamation was, It is finished. That the work of redemption was accomplished. Jesus, of course, as we've heard many times, no doubt, Jesus did not say, I am finished, but He said, It is finished. Redemption's payment was paid in full. No other work needs to be completed. It's all by grace through faith. And we thank the Lord for the work that He does in the heart to bring us to salvation. And that's a work of grace and, and, and that's a decision of faith on our part. But understand, that's just the beginning of that journey of faith. And that journey of faith continues throughout our lives. And I want to remind you tonight as, as parents that you have a responsibility to, to point your children tonight, your, the next generation, to live a life of faith and a life of hopeful faith. To realize that we are not following someone blindly, someone that we cannot see, someone that we cannot necessarily experience uh, before our eyes tonight in a physical way. Please understand that we have a responsibility to point our, our generations that are coming up behind us to see a God that is real. A God that has a plan, a perfect plan for each of them tonight. Let's read together Psalm 78. You follow along as I read, please. Verse number 1 down through verse number 7. Psalm 78, verse number 1. It says, Give ear, O my people. To my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue in his word tonight. Lord, we are truly thankful that we have your word here and a language that we can read from and understand. Thank you for how you have preserved your word in the English language. Lord, we believe that you've preserved it in other languages as well. But Lord, we thank you that it's been preserved in the English language for us to be able to read tonight and to preach from tonight. And Lord, I pray that tonight your Holy Spirit would move in our midst, Lord, within us. Thank you that if we are saved tonight, we have been bought and we have become a, a temple of your Holy Ghost, your Holy Spirit. And so tonight, that Holy Spirit that indwells us as believers, I pray that we would be sensitive to him. Or that tonight we would be obedient, as we heard the song just a moment ago, to trust and obey. Lord, to believe your word that you tell us tonight and to be obedient to it. 
Lord, if there would be somebody here in this, this audience tonight, this congregation, that is lost, Lord, that is without you, they do not know you as, as their personal Savior tonight. Lord, I pray that tonight, uh, through your word and through even the testimony and influence of others around them, uh, Lord, that tonight they would bow the knee humbly before you in repentance and brokenness over their sin and would come to you by faith, placing that faith completely in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they would be saved tonight. Lord, guide the preaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 78 is really kind of a review of the history of the Israelites and what God had done specifically within the wilderness wanderings. And this isn't the only chapter we find this. You find it oftentimes throughout the scriptures and not just in the Old Testament. You find it in the New Testament as well. And it's just a reminder how often we should speak of what God has done in our lives. You see, if we forget to praise the Lord, eventually we will lose the hope that we have when we do praise the Lord. When we rejoice in God, we're reminded about how good God is. Unfortunately, we are in a country today that has left, and, and I know it's not built necessarily on the same foundation that the United States was built upon, but I do believe that it is built upon a, a Christian heritage, a, a godly foundation, and, and I'm thankful for the churches that are scattered across this country. But understand, we live in a very dark day today within this country. We live in a very wicked day today in this country. And may I challenge you and encourage you as Christians that we still have the same hope that the people of Israel had when they, when they exited the, the land of Egypt out into, yes, the, the wilderness, but eventually into the promised land, that those promises were just as secure for them today as God's promises are for us today within this country that we live in. And so may we continue to keep our eyes upon the Lord. It is essential that we set before the generations following an attitude or a spirit of hope. We are truly living in difficult and dark days in this nation of Canada. I hope that you pray for our country. By the way, I have applied for my citizenship to become a Canadian. So that's still in the works. Again, please don't hold it against me if that's a problem with you. But I look forward to really calling this country my home. And I hope that you have a burden for the nation of Canada. I hope that you pray for revival. I hope that you pray for our leader. You know, so often we can be critical of, of the government that we have. And, and I often say that they're doing the best that they can in what they have. Many of them are lost. Many of them do not, uh, do not accept the word of God. Many of them do not know the truth. And so let's pray for our government. Let's pray for the officials that are, that are leading. And I praise the Lord for those that are in government that are Christians, that are believers, and doing their best to stand for truth in those positions. And let's pray for them as well. Amen. And continue to pray for God to do a work in this nation of Canada. We do have hope. And we must pass it down through our praise before the Lord. Psalm 145 and verse number 4, it says, One generation shall praise thy works to another. And shall declare thy mighty acts. You see, the same God that was the God of the Bible is that same God that we serve today and say that we place our faith and our trust in. And so before our children, before the generation following, before your grandchildren, it ought to be, let's praise the Lord for what he's doing. One generation shall praise thy works to another. Continuing to pass down the torch, so to speak, of the goodness of God and what we've seen God do in our lives. Psalm 50 and verse number 6, the very last psalm that we find, it says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Will it be said of you that on your deathbed, your very last breath was used to praise the Lord? And it may not be that on your deathbed that you even have much of a breath to speak, but in your heart will it be giving praise to God? Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 107, verse number 8, 15, 21, and verse 31, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. How we must be a church, how we must be a people, how we must be a, a, a nation that praises God for his goodness and for his works within our lives. You know, we can start by praising him for his creation. We have the opportunity to see the beauty of God surrounding us. 
You know, it's difficult coming from British Columbia and driving over the mountains and, and seeing the, the beauty of that and, and then entering into the, the, uh, the hills in, in, in Alberta and then into Saskatchewan, and I think that's the order we came, and then into um, Manitoba and seeing the, the, the prairies, the plains, and, and yes, the flatland, and, and the valley here that, there is a valley here somewhere, right? <laughs> I've been told it's here. But you know, as we drove across, and I, and I told my, my wife, I said, it's amazing how the beauty of God's creation is not just found in one location. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. How we can see the glory of God on display wherever we go. Whatever place you call home. And God has not left us without evidence of His working in, in, in our world. And, and, of course, our world today wants to push that all aside and figure out another way how this could have all come to be. Oh, but don't miss it. It's pointing back to our great Creator. And in your own life, that miracle of salvation. I remember when all four of our children were born, and I hope, parents, that you remember when your children were born. Some of you here have more children than others, a lot more children than others, possibly. But I hope you remember those births, and I, I can remember uh, the, the miraculous moment that it was, when, especially when my, our first child, Joshua, came out, and I began to realize it was a humbling experience that I was a father. And just that moment of time, and, and I realized the miracle of, of birth, of, of life. But all so much more is the miracle of the new birth within your life of, of being redeemed. Being a child of God. To enter into God's family. And I hope and pray tonight, if you do not know the Lord as your Savior, that tonight you would make the decision by faith to put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and, and come before Him and trust Him and be saved and enter into that family and experience that new birth that Jesus told Nicodemus about as He said, you must be born again. The miraculous works of our God, may we never forget them. You see, often our hearts tend to wander and desire which, that which God does not have for us, thus leading us rather to complain or to complaining rather than praising. Often we can look around and we can, we can fear, we can wonder what the future holds for the generations to come. Some of you may be a little bit up in years, later in years, and you think, what's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to my grandchildren, my great grandchildren? What are they going to face? What are they going to go through? I began to wonder that at times and think of that at times. And just as our country and the things that are, have gone on. And God brought me to Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2, which I believe is a psalm of Moses. He said, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. In every generation, God has been God. And don't forget, in every generation to come, God will still be God. We don't have to fear what's going to happen to our grandchildren, to our, our great-grandchildren. God will take care of them. You say, well, what if they face persecution where they're you know, thrown into lion's den or, 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 or burned at the stake? And may I remind you, look, that's happened before. And all it did was move the gospel forward. And may we be willing to, to, to surrender our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to be used of God however He desires. When we sell ourselves out to God, we place ourselves in trusting Him that He will accomplish His work through us as we are truly surrendered, trusting by faith that God is truly faithful. And so we want to Encourage our generations following to be a generation of hope. God's directions today are still the same when He said the just shall live by faith. It will still be active in years to come for our children and many generations to follow. Faith is not doubtful, but is based in an expectant hope found not in what we believe, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking unto Jesus, not looking unto your faith. A lot of people will say, well, I have my faith. That's not where your hope is found. Your hope is found in a person. 
Your hope is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that finished the work that his Father, our Heavenly Father, sent him to do. Looking unto Jesus, not looking unto your faith. Your faith is rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where our hope is found. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What we heard Pastor preach about this morning, looking to that day, continuing to persevere unto that day, expecting God to return in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we look forward to that. You see, that idea of looking is to, is to wait for, and that idea of hope is to have expectation, and it's to have confidence. It's not a, a doubtful hope, but it's one that has confidence within it. As we think about the next generations, yesterday I was at the parade, and I'm thankful for the opportunity we had to be a part of that. And Pastor Rimple, thank you for organizing it all and those of you that decorated. And really, it was helpful to, to myself and my family to kind of see the city here of Winkler and get to, 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 to know the demographics, so to speak, of, of how God has uh, established this city. And I was just in awe of how many children were in this city. As we walked down the street and we saw, of course, you know, they had intentions of candy. Uh, some had bags that were almost completely full. Uh, some kids didn't have much at all. It kind of felt bad for them. Uh, but, you know, uh, hopefully the kids that had a lot would give it to the others. We know how that works. Uh, sharing is caring, right? It's an important thing to do. But the children that just continued to line the street. And I see that in this church, the amount of children, the amount of youth in this church. And I hope that excites you. There is great potential there's great hope in this country, not because we have a lot of children, but because God can do a lot through those kids. And as we present them to the Lord, as we give them to God, I, I trust that you will always recognize that children are a blessing. The fruit of the womb is His reward. Possibly some of you in this room were not able to have children. But you still know that God is good and that God has been faithful within your lives. And I trust that you will be actively involved in enriching and investing in the next generation to come and pointing them to the Lord. There's great potential in, in our youth. But you know the devil understands that as well. Yeah. Satan wants her children to work for him rather than working for the Lord. Satan has no good intentions for our children he has undermined, as we've seen very clearly, the value and really the, the, the proper home structure, what a family is, and just breaking apart the, the mom and the dad. Hey, God made it very simple. Man and woman come together, and, and, and the children continue to come after and generations to follow. God made it very simple. Our world has made it very complicated. And God's home structure is simple. And, and, and sometimes I know that it doesn't necessarily work out that way, but the mom and the dad, and of course the dad being the, the leader within that home, and, and we find that the mom's supporting that dad. And, and I know not every home is in a sense where both mom and dad are, are Christians, are believers. And I trust if you're in that situation that you would honor the Lord within that home. But God's structure is that mom, that dad, that, and the children that come underneath with respect and submission and obedience. And that's God's design, but our country is destroying that, breaking it apart. In many parts of our world, in our country, children have become a hindrance to the progress of their parents. A woman should have rights to have an abortion. Why? So she can continue in her career. So she can continue her education. And of course, I think you believe it tonight that it's not right for, for anyone to take the life of an unborn child. I, I don't think I necessarily need to preach on that uh, tonight, but, but we understand that, that what this has possibly done within the hearts of young people has caused them to question where their value is, where their purpose is. And by the way, may I encourage you to be careful not to build your success on the backs of your children. A lot of parents, even back where we came from, their investment was in their children, so eventually their children would, would take care of them. And the importance of the, uh, the education and all of that is very important. But please understand that God has a specific calling for each of the young people within this church. Guide your children, guide the, the youth to, to look to the Lord for direction and know that He's going to care for them. Know that He will be faithful to them as well. And no doubt this has led many to wonder what their purpose is in life. It's found leading them to often look for it in other places, 
other people, and other things. Thankful for the opportunity that many of you have had to go to the Union Gospel Mission. The Lord allowed us to start what was called Reformers Unanimous back in Burnaby. And we are part of that, and it's an addictions program to help those that have suffered from what we might call substance abuse and, and really just habits that they chose, unfortunately, to resort to for various reasons. It could have been peer pressure. It could have been uh, just a, a broken home and situations that le- led them to that situation. But understand, people will look for the answer in all sorts of places. May I encourage you to continue to guide the generations following to look to the Lord. He has the answers that we need. In the books of Moses, especially in Deuteronomy, we see a great emphasis placed upon the people of Israel to pass their heritage to the generations to come to pass on the praise of God, to pass on the stories of of how God was working, of all that God was doing. And I have three simple points tonight to give to you as we uh, run through this message here tonight. Number one, I want to encourage you to be grateful for the influence of the past. Be grateful for the influence of the past. In verse number one, we see that Asaph says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Psalm 78, verse 1. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Asaph gathered the attention of the people here, and he he began to get the people to listen. It's important that we, when we're speaking, that people are listening. If I'm up here tonight and can tell that nobody is interested in what I have to say, I might be a little... Hurt? Well, I'll probably just continue on. You know, if everybody's sleeping, I wonder if, you know, if, if I'm putting too many people to sleep. Maybe I need to tell a joke or something like that. But the idea is that when we talk, we want people to listen. And Asaph said, look, I've got something to tell you. I've got something important to speak into your ears. Give heed. Listen to what I have to say. And he began to open his mouth in verse number 2. We see in verse number 3 that he is giving to them what was given to him. He spoke of what was poured into him by his parents and generations before. He had taken it in, and he was not ashamed to speak of it. Parents, let's not be ashamed of what God has done in our lives, in your lives. Adults, you may not have children, or your children may be grown. But don't forget you are influencing generations following you. Are you a person of praise? Are you a person of passing that praise down, praising of God to the generations to come? Be grateful for the influence of the past. Number two, number two, fulfill your responsibility to speak, teach, preach, and sing of the goodness of God. Fulfill your responsibility to speak, teach, preach, and sing of the goodness of God. You say, Pastor Raver, I can't sing. You know what? God says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You see, when my family says it's a horrible noise, go find another place. Find a place where your family can't hear. Give them earplugs, something like that, and just sing out. Sing of the goodness of God. You say, I'm a lady, I can't preach. You know, the Bible tells us to declare the works of the Lord. You may not be able to stand in this pulpit and proclaim as, as, as pastor does, but, but there are places that you can declare the works of God. You have an opportunity to speak of these things, to teach. Take every opportunity that you are given within your lives to speak and to teach of of what God has done, what God is doing. Really, the reason I'm speaking on this tonight is because through this faith journey that God put us on, my wife and I endeavored to do what we could to show our children how God was leading and show in the different areas where God was directing. I don't have time to tell you tonight, but there were some very specific things that my wife and I were able to see that God was pointing in this direction. I wish at times that God would just write it in the sky for us and just make it very clear. And God says, I have made it clear. As you seek me, you will know. But it was our desire to point our children to recognize where God was working, how God was working. And so as we think about this responsibility, the praises of God were to be spoken to the generations to come. It says in verse number four, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. We're not going to hold them back. We're going to let them to be known to the generations to follow. 
the praises of God were to be spoken to generations have come. In verse number 5, we see that the children would then know the word of God. Look in verse number 5, it says, For he established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Continue to pass down these words. We call the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, and of course uh, also the Mosaic law, that being that uh, which is given in the book of Exodus and, and, and following uh, that, the, the book as well. And we understand as well that these are the words of God. And they were to be passed down to the generations to follow. In verse number six, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. You see, God is the God of every generation. He's not just the God of one generation. God has a plan within every generation. And regardless of the persecution that may come in, God has still said it's important that you pass down to the next generation so that they would not forget His works. We see as well that the children would also know the God of the Word. They would not just know the Word of God, but that they would know the God of of the word. In verse 7, it says that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. It is vital that our children and grandchildren do not just grow up knowing the facts of the Bible, but that they would know God. Amen. That they would know God. You see, if I just know the stories of Adam and Eve, and if I know the stories of, of Jonah and the whale and David and Goliath, and those are all great stories, but understand that it was in all of those situations there was God working in them right. and through them. Yes, we want to teach the Bible stories, and Sunday school teachers continue to teach those stories, but don't lead the children astray to think that these are just make-believe stories like one preacher that I heard talk about somebody that went to the promised land and they went with their pastor and when they went to the promised land there in, in Israel and they looked at their pastor and they said, hey, this is actually real. Maybe that's where we are tonight. I've never been to Israel and I'd love to go someday, but this is a real book and it's pointing us to a very real God and a God that wants to work in our lives as well as the generation of youth here tonight. Kids, I want to challenge you tonight. Don't miss God through all of this. As you watch your parents maybe at times struggle, you know what? Find a closet somewhere. Find a quiet place and get on your knees as a child and pray. Yeah. You say, I don't really know what to say. Just talk to the Lord. Amen. Just talk to Him. Yeah. Like you'd go to your mom or dad or somebody else and talk to them. You talk to the Lord. There's no magical formula to speak to God in the sense you have to have just the right words. Just talk to the Lord. Pour out your heart before Him. Get to know God. Get to know how He works and what He wants to do in your life. Knowing facts can lead to pride, but knowing God will lead to a genuine humility and love for Him and His Word. It's not going to be something that's forced upon you. It's going to be something that you are willing to accept, receive, and believe. It says here in verse 7 that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep His commandments. Lastly tonight, encourage us to live with a hope-filled faith. Live with a hope-filled faith. Now, I thought that was kind of an interesting point tying together with donuts tonight, right? It's a very spiritual thing. Of course, you, know, you may have a favorite donut, but there are donuts that are filled with something. <clears throat> Actually, sometimes they don't fill them. Sometimes you'll bite and bite and bite, and the donut's almost gone, and you'll finally hit the filling. And um, I've always compared that to some of us, how we maybe live in that ho Holy Spirit filling is like a donut, you know, where it's not full. But sometimes you'll bite into a donut and it just explodes all over your shirt. And that's the best. You, you just bite in it and there's all the filling that you need. And that's what our faith needs to be. Not like a donut, but it needs to be filled with hope. We don't have a doubtful faith, we have a hopeful faith. Trusting in the God that created us. Trusting in the God that saved us. You see, we can see a contrast here in Psalm 78. Uh, the results of, of not trusting, of not living in hope. Verse 11, it says, And they forgot His works and His wonders that He had showed them. We go on to read in verse number 17, And they sinned yet more against Him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. You can read in verse number 22, it says, Because they believed not in God and trusted not in His salvation. And you can read verse 32, it says, For all this they sinned still and believed not for His wondrous works. Look, they missed out. 
God did all sorts of things in their presence and they missed out on recognizing the power of God in their lives. And may I remind you, church family, tonight, don't miss out on what God has done and will do in your lives. God is faithful. May we live that life of of a hope-filled faith. The life of a hopeful faith is one that lives for and and seeks to please God. Go with me as we kind of wrap this up tonight in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. Pastor didn't really give me a time limit tonight, um, but I know that all of you are dreaming of donuts, so we'll uh, finish up here quickly. Hebrews chapter 11, and it says in verse number 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith in the unseen, faith in what some would call the unknown. But the idea of faith is really a persuasion. It's something that we have been convicted of, we have been convinced of. The idea of that substance is like a support, is to stand under. You think of columns that come under a building. Those of you in the balcony tonight, I'm, I'm sure that you're thankful for these columns that are supporting you. If those were not there, uh, we'd know the, the end results. And, and you understand the importance of a structure that is holding up. The same way that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, to, to hold it before the people uh, that, that surround us. And, and that faith, the Bible says, is the substance, that it's not just something that is in visible, that we actually have something that we can be confident in that supports us in this journey of faith, we see as well that that idea of hope is to be expectant. I'm so thankful that when we set our hope in God that we will not be disappointed. Faith believes that God is, verse number 6 of Hebrews 11, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith believes that God is, and that faith comes with earnest expectations as a result of seeking him. That God is a rewarder of those that will diligently seek him. Those that keep their hope in God will never be disappointed in him. You know what? Life is filled with disappointments. But if you will set your hope in God, you will never be disappointed within Him. God is always faithful. We may be disappointed in some things that we cannot do, some places that we cannot go, some, some uh, uh, maybe just situations that we didn't ask for. But as we continue to set our hope in God, as the psalmist Asaph wrote about there in verse number 7 of our text, we can do that today. We can place our hope in God. Psalm 42 and verse number 5 Psalmist David said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? The word disquieted has to do with making a loud noise. It's almost as if there's a battle going on, a raging within the soul of the psalmist. He said this, Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And so young people tonight, I encourage you to direct your attention to the Lord may not always see it perfectly in your parents. Parents, I encourage you to live the life of faith. Point your children to the Lord. May we be faithful in directing the generation to come that we have hope in God, that we can place our hope in the Lord. Psalmist said, Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Be a person that lives a life of praise. You see, hope returns to our soul when we return to praise. When we set our hearts upon praise, that hope comes back. We live in a very dark day, but may I tell you that we have hope. Looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have hope. Are you a person that reflects the hope uh, that you have in Jesus Christ to those around you? And specifically to the generation to come. You see, if you're witnessing to someone of the gospel, make sure that they can see in you a character of hope, a spirit of hope. Don't be down in the dumps all the time. Talk about the joy of the Lord being your strength and how God has made a difference within your life. Let them see, and by your words, and as we learn in Matthew chapter 5, by our good works, they will see that light, and, and they will begin to glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Have you been discouraged, fearful, worried about the situation in our world around us? Hope in God. Hope in God. 
Recognize that even though you may not have grown up in a Christian home that taught you the Word of God, someone still fulfilled their responsibility to get it to you. It may not have been parents. It could have been a coworker. It could have been a friend. But they fulfilled their responsibility to speak of the things of the Lord, to speak of the works of God. Recognize that, that uh, or sorry, choose to live a life of hope-filled faith and declare to the generations to come that God is truly great. Psalm 73, verse 28, it says, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. We have a great responsibility tonight to point the generation following to look to the God of hope, the God that is worthy of our trust, and the God that will never let us down if we continue to keep our eyes upon Him. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to work with college students here, the investment of trying to help them and and directing them to follow the Lord's desire for their lives. Each one of you in this room, I hope and pray that you Come with an open heart, an expectant heart. When you open God's word, that God would feed you and direct you in the way that he would have you to go. Again, maybe you're here tonight. You say, I don't know the Lord. I don't know that this this God that you're talking about, but I want to know more. I encourage you to come even to the front tonight and, and talk to one of the pastors here. You know what? God has a plan for your life, and that plan is salvation. That plan is that journey of faith to get to know him. And his wonderful works. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Please thank you so much for your attention. We'll have an invitation here as the instrumentalists come. Where would you find yourself tonight? Would you find yourself in the place of great despair? You know what? Turn back to the Lord. There is hope. We find that hope in God. Are you here tonight and you don't know the Lord as your Savior? Why don't you come to the front tonight? Someone will meet you down here at the front. and You just grab a hold of their hand and let them know. Tap them on the shoulder let them know, I don't know Christ as my Savior, but I'd like to. Would that be you tonight? Parents, grandparents, are you being faithful and passing on the generation to the next generation, those praises and the hope that we have in the Lord?